In a separate maths cast, I have proved the product rule for differentiating a product from first principles. I urge you to watch that maths cast before watching this one, because the technique is the same, but this one is just a little bit more complicated. Here I'm going to take y to be a quotient, f of x divided by g of x. I'm going to write down the first principles differentiation rule for y, and then substitute this particular form, f over g, into that differentiation rule. Here we go. So remember we take the limit as the run goes to zero of the rise over the run for the function y. Then we substitute that special structure f of x over g of x into that formula. That will give us two terms on top, one of them with x plus h in, the other with just x in. Looks rather cumbersome, doesn't it? Here we're going to have to add and subtract two terms again in order to split the limit in a similar way to what we did with the product rule. However, I don't like fractions over the top of fractions, so I'm going to take that denominator h out and put it to the side and write it as 1 over h, multiplied by the stuff inside the bracket. There, that looks a little less top-heavy, doesn't it? Before adding and subtracting the extra terms, what I need to do here is to collect everything over a single denominator. The single denominator will be the product of g of x plus h multiplied by g of x. Here's what it looks like. If you know the quotient rule already, then you might be starting to see how the g of x all squared is going to come about in the denominator. We'll see that in detail in a minute. Our next task is to identify two terms to insert on top, well that is to say insert and then subtract again, in order that the two terms already there contribute to forming derivatives of f and g. This is a bit different to the product rule, because in the product rule we had f of x plus h, g of x plus h, and f of x, g of x. Whereas here, already, we have the mixed up terms, f of x plus h with g of x, and vice versa. That means that the insertion needs to consist of the pure terms. In fact, we can add and subtract f of x times g of x to the top here. That turns out to be what we need to do. So there are the original terms with a space left for the insertions. Here are the insertions. So just like in the product rule, we add and subtract the same term. The term we've chosen is appropriate for splitting the limit into two and then factorizing a piece off to leave a rise over a run. Let's do that in detail now. So there's the first pair and the second pair. Look at the first limit here. The top has a factor of g of x. We can pull that g of x out. In fact, we can pull it right out of the limit, because it doesn't depend on h. Let's do that before attending to the second limit. Here it is. I've done something else here too, haven't I? I've pulled the g parts out to the front now, and replaced them with the h underneath. That makes the f minus f over h part look exactly like a rise over a run. So we're going to see there the derivative of f. What about the second limit? The second limit has a factor f of x. That can also be pulled out as a factor and taken, again, right to the front of the limit. Let's do that. Here's what it looks like. The f of x is at the front. The 1 over g times g has been pulled to the front and Oh, is that a rise over a run there? Actually, it's the wrong way round, isn't it? The rise over the run would be g of x plus h minus g of x. We'd better fix that by swapping the order and changing the sign at the front of the limit to be minus instead. Now, those g's are still written in an unfamiliar order, but at least they are correct to denote the rise for the function g. We now perform both the limits. In the first limit, f of x plus h minus f of x over h becomes f primed. What happens to the 1 over g times g bit? Well, the h turns to 0, and the g of x plus h becomes g of x. So we end up with 1 over g of x all squared. That's the first limit. Then we have to subtract 
Now what's happening here? Ah, just a moment. I forgot something, didn't I? On that first limit, there's also a G of X at the front. I'd better put that G in. That's better. Now what about the second one? This time there's an F at the front. Let's put it in straight away so we don't forget it. The treatment of the G times G bit will be the same. It will just give G squared underneath again. And then finally, the rise over the run part is just that. It's already got the right signs in, so it's just G primed. We could now collect everything over that common denominator G squared, and we have nothing other than our dear old quotient rule. There it is. Let's summarize the whole thing. So there is the quotient rule, proved from first principles. I'll stop there.